to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the project that has just been funded by the research, um, Health Research Council. Uh, so this was an emerging researcher grant. So the most exciting thing is that I'm still young enough to be considered emerging. <laughs> That's the main takeaway point that I want you to take away with you today, is that um, at 50 you can still emerge. That's very exciting. Uh, but essentially, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about this project, how it came to be, and sort of where we're going. But as a starting point, uh, maybe you might want to just talk to your neighbour for a minute and think about what would a fair, just, accessible and inclusive society look, look like for disabled people, uh, and how, what could be done to create an enabling society. So you've got five minutes to solve it. No, you've got two minutes actually <laughs> to solve it. So have a chat. What are the key things that you think need to happen in order to create an enabling society that's fair, just, accessible and inclusive? Right. Just on that note. What sort of things might you need to think about? Okay, so I'm interested. Do you want to call out some things of what would a fair, just, accessible, and in, um, inclusive society look like? What, what sort of things? What do you call a disabled person would be my first question. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, so the, the, um, the terminology is based on the New Zealand um, disability strategy, and it's uh, based on people's own experiences of uh, barriers that environmental barriers that they face which prevent them from being able to participate fully in society. So it's nothing to do with the particular health condition, it's the extent to which uh, there are barriers that stop them participating and accessing full uh, involvement in society. So it's a great, great starting question. Well, we suggested it was about a, a societal attitude, an environment that flows from that, everything found the foundation is the attitude of the entire society is the, yeah. the nature of disability, whether it's fear, uncertainty, anger, yeah. uh, whatever, that people react to that. Yeah. How you influence that is another question. Yeah, so attitudes, societal attitudes, feeding into stigma, taboo. And normalising yeah. difference. Normalising difference. Yeah. Bottom up. Bottom, Kate. Bottom down and bottom up. Yeah. yeah. And so that there's a mix. getting consumer and um, user-driven sort of representation of voices. Yeah, well, that's enabling a uh, much clearer vision of people so that disabled people are not invisible where people, um, able people perhaps feel that they don't see them as people. Mm -hmm. So respecting the, the mana and the, the humanity of everyone regardless of uh, how they might be able to function at a physical, cognitive, communicative level, etc. Cool. Okay, well, essentially this was the problem we faced because um, Burger Academy is um, given a mandate from um, the community of people who actually live with the experience of disability and they wanted us to focus research on four things and one of the four things was create a more enabling society. So, you know, just a small goal, yeah. um, but so we had to start, start sort of somewhere, uh, so we ended up with a blank bit of paper, uh, and the HRC have um, generously funded uh, this blank bit of paper, uh, and so we're not quite sure where we're going to go, and that's the end of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, no, we had to we had to come up with uh, something that HRC thought was at least a good enough idea to, to take a punt on, um, but we also wanted to leave, leave it loose enough uh, that it wasn't for me to create an enabling society, but to create a space where we could work together as a group. Um, so where did and how did the research question and aims develop? Well, it's been a... Um, We've, the Burwood Academy has called it our big kahuna project for a while now. I remember the day we, we sat down and tried to think how could we work towards getting funding into this space. So it's been an intentional um, step by step in, in that direction. Uh, and when I went and tried to um, record, because as part of the edits I had to sort of say who I consulted with because I hadn't followed the process that you could just tick the box and put in a form to say I have sent a consult consultation foreman, um, and so I had to record who I consulted with, so I sent them that instead, and that just shows over time the various discussions that we have had with various people and organisations and various projects. Um, so it's been, um, there's a research project which I've, um, uh, which we've done, uh, which was involved as a, a um, we called it flourishing scoping, where we actually talk to 30 people uh, who live with the experience of disability about from a strength-based perspective. Um, what is it that you find helps you to live well and flourish? And if we were going to build on what works well, what would that be? Uh, and then we've had, we had a, this one we haven't got funding for, but we were looking at um, possibilities of doing some case studies to look at different forms of um, representation and um, advocacy that happened within um, Osatahi Christchurch since the earthquakes, because there's been a number of advocacy, different models that have been set up for various purposes, and with, there's about 10 different groups that we were looking at groups <coughs> using as case studies to see how different models have worked or not to lead to change that supports um, outcomes or it would support um, accessibility and inclusivity. Uh, so that, that's still a, we'd love to get funding for that, so if you happen to have a benefactor who would love to fund that, please be in touch. Um, and then we've also obviously been looking at developing what I had up there is uh, flour flourishing housing, but it's actually flourishing together. And so I, I had a, a tour of duty around Wellington to go and speak to all the uh, a, a range of um, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Social Development, Housing and Urban Development, Office of Disability Issues, Karma Order, etc., etc., to have a talk and try and um, understand uh, how best we could work together with um, central agencies. And then obviously there's, we've also got relationships in various forms with a lot of the advocacy groups as well. So there's con been considerable discussion. It hasn't just come out of nowhere and nothing. Um, but we have to obviously, to get funding, you've got to apply for something specific. <laughs> um, and you can spend a lot of time. Who's filled an HRC funding application? How much did you love it? <laughs> I was a husk by the end of it. I tell you what, I had nothing left to do. Um, so what we're really <coughs> aiming to do with this is the sort of two key... We're really interested in what's going to come out of it rather than the process. So the things that are coming out of it, this is the blue bit is kind of our, our top priority. So we, in this various discussions, it became really apparent that, um, so just a, a terminology bit for a moment, so kaha pai kaha is a Māori term. Uh, Māori use it to talk about uh, people who experience disability as a direct translation. It, it, literally means people in search of empowerment. Right? So tangata waikaha is, is a Māori term. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that non-Māori are allowed to just take it up and use it. So we use the term tangata waikaha, Māori and non-Māori. So that that's clear. So just so you're understanding um, tangata waikaha, where that's coming from. So when we were talking to various people, they get really frustrated, they were expressing frustration at, a, at, at the Tangata Paikaha level to say, look, we try and contribute and we try and meaningfully engage, but basically they've already made their minds up. They're just coming with a, and saying, what do you think of our good ideas? We're not actually framing the discussions. We're not actually able to say, have you thought about this issue? And that, so they're not meaningfully contributing to the discussions that are happening that are informing policy. 
At the other side of the coin, um, people who are trying to gather the ideas of Tangata Pukbaha are finding it really frustrating and difficult because the processes are difficult and they don't have the tools and strategies to, to gather together uh, and, and then gather um, meaningful um, perspectives, etc., that they can use. All right, so they need, they need to, they're, they're working in a really rapid changing environment I'd like to support those ongoing conversations. That's a primary thing. But we had to base it around an example because we couldn't just sort of develop that out of nothing. And clearly housing and a sense of home, so kāinga, was really important. It's coming up again and again. We've seen it in the media. Um, and there's lots of uh, issues that it's broader than just physical accessibility and an accessible home. It's, is there a, do I have access to a sense of home, a place where I can uh, feel safe, where I'm embedded within a community where I want to be, where I can live intergenerationally if I want to, where I can um, uh, participate fully in the ways that I want to. Uh, so there's the broader aspect that we're going to look at as we try and develop these tools and strategies. Any questions? So who's on the, in the core research team? So because you have to get together a group of people to show HRC that as an emerging researcher you're well supported. So this is my, so this is our, our group. And we see ourselves very much as a, a pretty flat leadership structure. Uh, we're going, we haven't met yet, so that's some <laughs> um, Still being email. Um, but we're going to be very flat leadership structure. Isn't that right, Katie Joe? Uh, so you can see Kate and Joe there. We're also working with Kirsten Smyler, who works at the Victoria University of um, Victoria. What do, what do you say? Victoria. University of Wellington, because they don't want to use Victoria. Um, she's a Kopapa Māori researcher, uh, and she was born, uh, brought up in a uh, deep household, and so sign language is her first language, uh, and te reo is her second language, and English is her third language, which is very cool, and she's really interested in the intersection between uh, Māori and kōpapa Māori methodologies and um, disability. So she's going to work with us, uh, and um, we're really fortunate to have Tā Marama and Kate, um, our local uh, support and amazing experts in this area as well. Leslie Middleton is also at Victoria, works with Kirsten, and is, has been involved in policy. Um, so she teaches at the into policy area, health policy. Um, Jean Hay Smith, some of you will know, Joe and Nick Hayes, and so various people with various skills along the way, uh, which are sort of contributing to what we're going to do. Now I say what we're going to do because we kind of have an overall design, but it is up for discussion. So it is it is a black it is a blank page, but we had to tell them what we were going to do, and I've had to set objectives. I've tried to keep them really, really vague, um, but we'll see how we go. So essentially we're going to, wanting to work with a Tangata Paikaha Māori and non-Māori co-production team. So this is 20 people that will work with us across the three years of the project. They will be paid. They're not volunteers, they will, that's what the funding partly comes to. So we are paying people for the hours they work uh, in order to be part of this co-production team. We're also working really closely with an expert stakeholder advisory group, um, so and that will involve the policy policy peoples that I've already connected with, but also um, leading disability advocates from within New Zealand, who Hana Hickey, um, and there's and many others that are, are joining in with that um, process as well. And then what I said we would do within the HRC grant is this sort of thing. It's not very easy to read, so I'll. So essentially what we thought we would do is three <coughs> phases. The first phase is gathering the Tangata Whaikauha co-production team. I'll just call it the co-production team. <coughs> the co-production team together to actually even decide the scope of the work and what we're going to focus on. And it is going to be housing. We'll keep them to housing and home. Kind of. We won't let them go too far. But the, the scope is will be up for discussion. And then... Um, there's already lots of information out there in the media and in, in um, public discourse and stuff about the different factors that are impacting on people's ability to access kind and that meets their needs and aspirations. So that's kind of going to be framing up the work. We were then going to look at doing um, a, what I've called a qualitative survey, 
we were wanting to get broader representation from um, or um, uh, hear a broader perspectives from across New Zealand. I'm saying survey, but we're going to have to think really carefully about mode um, because we want various ways of people being able to access and, and generate and, and contribute their perspectives. Um, but this is a developing a method uh, that will work. Um, so that's what that is about. Um, and then this last bit is a realist review. As you know, I'm a bit of a realist buff. Um, and what I would really, uh, what we're aiming for is for the, the co-production team to work alongside us as researchers and analyse the literature, make meaning, produce co-produce meanings with us, and then that will feed into. So they are going to be journeying alongside us as we analyse and generate, in, analyse the data and generate new knowledge. All right. So. So the, those are sort of the methods. Along the way, we're going to um, hopefully uh, be a bit innovative about how we work together with the Tangata Whaikaha team as well, uh, so that we're developing uh, resources that are fun. You know, I have visions of Lego, mm -hmm. and you know, interactive. Um, I'm not. I'm, I'm going to say, you know, there's all sorts of exciting ways we could do it. So we're not. We're not going to do focus groups. Put it that way. We're going to do something fun. So, um, but in order to even start writing on your blank bit of paper, you need a pen, and that's what I've called the ethics. So we've got ethics. Yes. Who would have thought? Um, it was a it was a bit of a mission. I had an interesting discussion with the the chair of the ethics committee, and it was fantastic. But you know, there's a lot of assumptions even within ethics committees uh, that we've had to kind of um, uh, work with. So let me tell you a little bit more. Um, about the sort of the things that we've had to thought about, think about. In terms of the stakeholder advisory group, um, we, it's yet to be finalised, but there is already lots of different people who've, uh, I think I've got about 10 people that are already keen to support, and it's whether we go further and extend that or whether we keep it um, smaller. So that's one of the discussions we'll have um, as we go through. The interesting thing from a Tangata Paikaha perspective is that they are they are experts who are being paid in their role to provide expert advice, but they're also participants in a research project. So for ethics, this was a bit hard for them to get their heads around, um, and hard for us as well. So, uh, so that's been one of the, the sort of challenges that we're having to try and be really explicit about, that you've got these two different hats. And on one hand, you're going to, we're going to have to get consent from you and inform you very carefully about what we're gathering and how your data will be honoured and respected and used, etc. On the other hand, you are part of us as a team. You are, we are working on this together. So um, what we will actually do, they will, as I mentioned, will develop the the um, exact focus and scope of the research, and then we will tell, if we'll keep going backwards and forwards, so it's an ongoing conversation with the ethics committee about what's being developed and how it's going to happen, um, and they're very happy with that. How we're going to do it is actually also up for discussion, and our first, first decisions are around how we, how we, the processes around gathering, recruiting, selecting, remunerating um, the co-production team. Um, so that it's accessible and, and, um, and flexible. Uh, so I'll talk a wee bit. It is like a journey into the unknown. I was talking to Kate yesterday. Kate, are you, are you able to, in a moment's notice, tell people a little bit about what we were talking about yesterday in terms of navigating Waka with where you're not quite sure where you're going? Oh, well, you picked perfectly. The picture there is a Waka 4, which is what our Māori ancestors came out in from Hawaii. And in relation to this project, what it's similar to my ancestors coming out. We jumped on a, they jumped on a double hull canoe, and they knew they were going to something different. But all they had was the star, the moon, and the birds, and maybe the currents to guide them. And that's the framework we're looking at here. We didn't. None of my ancestors knew what um, Aotearoa looked like. The same for your own ancestors. If they came over in the 1800s, they jumped on a ship for six weeks. They didn't know really what they were coming to, apart from a few posters that had been written by some people, but they got on the waka, and that's again what we're building here. We're building 
bring the people on the ship or the, the wakahoa and we're going to head off into the sunset to a new horizon uh, and when we get there we'll be able to explain it. So that's why effort and developing the HRC has been such a credit to Rochelle because that's what we all decided and knew. And so already we are leading change by how we've applied for the funding and received it. So yeah, rather than the world's our oyster that Nan used to say, the sea is literally going to guide us to where we need to go. I love the confidence. Am I feeling overwhelmed? <laughs> yes! <laughs> but it is really, really fun. And, you know, um, uh, Kate's talked a little bit about guiding principles, and these aren't sort of what we've shared together as a group and come up with, and that's one of our first meeting aims will be as a, as a group, um, establishing the values that will guide, because we don't have the processes to guide, we're, we're going to have to have shared values that will guide uh, the way we go. Um, but we're really, really committed, I hope this is my brain up, very committed to co-producing meaning, not just backwards and forwards transactional exchange. So co-producing <coughs> meaning. Uh, really important for me is the centralisation of Māori knowledge and tikanga, so, and, and how that looks in practice. We need to nut out. Does it mean I had envisaged side by side, you know, double hull waka, we'll sail off together, you know, and somehow we'll connect at some point, but there's some really good critique around that already from the kaupapa uh, researchers within the team to say maybe there's a different way of doing it, maybe we need to explore that. So that's already um, up for discussion about how that actually looks. Really want to create some usable knowledge that will produce opportunities for change, absolutely committed to that. Um, and the other thing is that we're all on a learning journey, we're all on the waka together, we're all learning from each other. Um, and so we all um, have opportunities to develop and grow um, as we learn from each other. Just really quickly, I've got my time, is it? Nine minutes. <coughs> Nine minutes, that's right. I won't go into great detail. Um, but just, some, just, I thought you might be interested, some of the issues already that we've been thinking about as we, as we you know, do the really basic things of get ethics and, um, and yeah, well, that's it really. Of, with, applying for, you know, sorting out research systems and University of Otago funding systems. That's been my main work so far. But um, really interestingly, which ethics committee do you go to? So there was sort of like, do you go to HDEC or do you go to Otago? Um, but, and so there was a bit of, oh, you probably need to go with HDEC because they're consumers of health and disability services. And I'm going, but they're not being you, they're not being <coughs> asked to participate because they are consumers of health and disability services, they're asked to participate because they're citizens of New Zealand. Um, so how did that work? And then there was a, a sort of a bit of a question of, well, you know, they're vulnerable. What, what, what issues have you considered for this vulnerable group? So, like, well, let's reframe that. How could we, yes, they've got, um, we've, they've got varied needs that we're going to need to address really carefully. Um, but maybe maybe we need to think a wee bit differently about that. Um, then we have to make a choice about whether we do... Um, it, so initially we kind of thought it would be lovely to do face-to-face -face workshops. You know, the co-production team would be lovely to meet face-to-face, because -face, then we could really play with Lego and, you know, <laughs> do all sorts of fun things together. Uh, and then, of course, COVID's happened and a lot of things have happened and we've thought deeply. And so we're actually, we've made a choice to go with um, uh, national recruitment for our team uh, and it's a pros and cons and I've got a few up there that we've, we've considered as we've been going and we gave these pros and cons a list to ethics so they could understand that we have been through a process of, of thinking about this um, and one of the reasons that's given me confidence is that I've been in touch with um, Joe Langley who's a, a designer, co-design <coughs> Uh, leader over in the UK and over COVID he's developed a lot of resources and tools for online co-production with people with communication difficulties and um, who, who um, need more support in terms of sharing, uh, sharing uh, more abstract ideas uh, and so there's already some other work being done in the UK and I figure I, I'm on a learning journey so let's take fun I'm sure we can make it fun might, we might have to send out lots of Lego sets uh, and then there's the whole issue of decision making, process for decision making around who's on the Pamata Paikaha co-production team. So we could get only 20 apply, 
well, we could get 100 applied. And how do we ensure that we uh, are non-discriminatory, that we're ethical, and that we're mana-enhancing mana in the process that we use for determining who's on that team? And so we're starting to you know, think about what do we need to think about as we make those decisions and get those processes in place? How do we make sure we're amplifying voices of some subgroups, we're making sure that accessibility needs are able to be met um, but we're not discriminating on the basis of that? How do we make sure that people feel like they can um, continue to be involved even if they're not on the initial, you know, the 20, etc.? So those are all issues uh, that we've been thinking of. And it is a journey into the unknown, but it is an exciting journey. Um, I'm sure we'll have some rough seas along the way. Um, but there's a sense of... Um, Joe's been banging on about it all year. It's a new thing, like, out of tension comes great... What is it, Joe? Out of tension comes great possibilities and new ways of thinking. So don't be afraid of tension. And so that's kind of where we're sitting. There's these unknown things, and there's some tensions, and there's going to be some good, robust discussions. Um, but we, we think that out of that will grow some amazing stuff. It's a whakatauki. Poi poi a te kakano ki a puawai. And it's talking about nurture the seed so that it will blossom. Um, and and Tama Marama shared that whakatauki with us uh, and said, uh, potentially this is what we're, we're trying to do through this process. It's nurturing a seed, but there's tension within that as well. Um, and it's not necessarily an easy or straightforward or immediate uh, process. It's a, it's a along the way one. So that's just a brief introduction of where we... What, what preparations we've done for the journey so far. And um, I look forward to sharing with you how the journey's going along the way. Yeah, any questions? Any thoughts? Any things I need to think about, we need to think about, because we're gratefully accepting. Marty? Um, or obviously, um, or a really great presentation. Um, like I know I've been involved in Flourish, but today, um, but obviously, um, and we heard some of the um, finer details, so great. Um, yeah, um, certainly, <coughs> um, certainly a research project which is um, maybe long overdue because I guess um, if you look at other fields, probably um, you're not always a lot of uh, research done around disability and, um, and um, what works well for, um, what works well to, um, of the marginalised sector of society. Um, and your last comment um, is that, um, yes, yeah, certainly, um, that project, um, um, wherever it presents itself, um, I guess having as many people involved with, um, involved with um, lived experience um, are the better, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and we're, you know, we're looking also at ensuring that it's people's lived experience involved in all levels of the of the project as well. So it's not just just that group, but you know, at all levels of advisory. And, yeah. Any questions? Well done getting ethics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't it believe like it's it's going to be uh, a you know, there's no end. No. You haven't got an end point. You know, no. you haven't got this like you say a procedure to an end point, and then you'll be a lot of to and fro, and it could potentially change. Yeah, change direction, but you know. Yeah. Well, the form didn't quite work. The ethics form yeah. didn't quite work. So in the end, I wrote a memorandum of understanding. So I thought that that sounded quite fancy. Yeah. And I attached it to the front of the ethics form to explain our process using what was going to work for us in terms of this is what we're doing when and why and things we're thinking about. And I, did, and I had a meeting with them. And so, you know, that, that was also really helpful. Um, but yeah, still, in the end, the ethics just in, in and of itself by the time I... Because they... The other thing is we hadn't done Māori consultation according to the University of yes. Otago consultation process, but yeah. we've clearly done Māori consultation that where Māori are involved. So I had to fully, I had to write a two-page <coughs> summary of how we consulted and how those various discussions had contributed to the final design. Um, and so 70 pages went to ethics in the end. Um, yeah, uh, just to say, we're not quite sure. <laughs> I love the power of that, like they're a change agent already and haven't 
you're yeah. only just beginning and you, you're affecting change in, in what can be quite a rigid system mm. and it's going to have an impact for researchers mm. in all different areas as they come through because you're changing the mindset mm. of those in, in, in the ethics department. Mm. Yeah. Well, I do have to, um, you know, obviously I wear a Burwood Academy hat and I've got this project with Otago but um, with a large subcontract to Burwood Academy. Mm. The main reason is that Otago Systems cannot cope with paying uh, people with lived experience um, an hourly amount. So you have to take them on on a full-time equivalent contract for a set amount of time between these dates and these dates. Um, and so they don't have the flexibility of systems. So that was my main reason. But even when I was talking to <coughs> ethics, they were sort of saying, well, you don't really, you know, could we just give them vouchers? Because you don't really want a, you know, a, any responsibility in terms of um, uh, human resource responsibilities, etc. you know, in terms of OSH, etc. And I said, well, it sounds a little bit discriminatory to me, you know, like, we're going to have to change the system. So there's already been some good discussions in terms of within Otago ethics around what what is ethical behaviour uh, in terms of um, fair and respectful remuneration for services and expertise offered. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, interesting. Anyway, um, lovely to see you all. There's more cake and you need to eat more, I think. So, um, and thank you so much for coming today and we'll look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>